Last week, we focused on the other SEM related techniques. Um, the first example we discussed is the plasma fib. We'll move to the second example. The second example is helium ion microscopy. So helium ion microscopy, um, let's look at the, uh, the, the source, the gun. It's very special. If you recall what we learned in the SEM electron sources, you have like a tip, super sharp tip, and you apply a voltage. Because the tip is super sharp, it will generate a very strong electric field. The electric field is able to pull electrons out which is called field emission or field assisted emission. In helium ion microscopy, what happens is you still have a super sharp gun, but the vacuum in the gun chamber is not as good as the electron gun, like the regular electron gun. Instead, in the chamber, you have helium gas. You have the helium gas molecules. So let's just draw some spheres that are floating around. Because they float around, there's a chance for the helium atom to be in contact with the, uh, um, with the probe. Then what happens is the first step is helium gas atom contacts the tip. The tip is very sharp. And the electron in the helium atom will channel into the, uh, the tip because it's positively biased. The, the voltage is very high. So it is able to strip the electron away to turn the helium atom into helium ion. So electron stripped away. By the highly positively charged tip. Now it is an ion instead of an atom. The ion, the helium ion is positively charged. The tip, the gun, the gun is also positively charged. So the gun will repel the helium. Um, I forgot to write down the intermediate step. So helium atom is turned into helium ion. Then helium ion is repelled by the tip. And that gives you the, uh, the source. So in SEM, what you have is electrons from the tip, from the, the source getting emitted, then it will interact with your specimen. But in helium ion microscopy, in abbreviation, HIM, in helium ion microscopy, the helium atoms, the electrons are stripped away and the helium ions will hit the specimen surface. It's similar to gallium source, similar but not exactly the same. In gallium source, what you have is you have the liquid metal, but here you have the gaseous helium, which is turned into ions. Then later on, it will interact with your specimen. In modern helium ion microscopes, the tip is extremely sharp. especially like the apex of the tip. If we view that from the bottom, looking at the very apex of the tip. So let me use a different color. So if we look at the very apex of the tip, what we have are actually just three individual atoms. By the way, the tip is also made from tungsten, from tungsten wire. 
if you are familiar with crystallography, if you see these three atoms stacking, you know it's along the 111 direction, where you see the 60 degree triangles or the three fold symmetry. Then the tip in helium ion microscope is so sharp that the terminal, the apex, the very end of the tip, has only three atoms. And helium gases, helium, helium gas molecules or helium gas atoms, they hit these one of the three atoms. Ideally, actually, only one atom is emitting the, uh, the, the, the helium ions. Um, the, the helium gas will hit the uh, whatever the atom is most protruding out. The electrons getting stripped away, and it will be ionized and then accelerated to the specimen. Because it's extremely, extremely sharp, so it's called trimer. We have a much, much better probe size in terms of the source. Better here means small. Smaller probe size than SEM. And in the first lecture, we learned if we are able to tune the beam size to a very small probe, that's the first step. We can get really good resolution. So this is the, uh, the ion source part. Any questions before we move on? So this is similar to SEM, the source similar to FIB, regular focus ion beam, but not exactly the same. You can see some differences. Okay, the next thing is we'll look at the second part of resolution, the beam material real interaction. Um, let me ask you, the interaction volume comparing um, helium ion microscopy to regular SEM do you think the interaction volume is larger or is it smaller? S smaller. Excellent, excellent. It's smaller. Now we have improved probe size. We also have smaller interaction volume because of these two things. So helium ion microscopy gives way better resolution than SEM. So these two, small probe size, as well as smaller interaction volume that gives you better resolution. The reason why the interaction volume is smaller is because just imagine like if uh, on the packed train, if you want to squeeze in one more person, even if it's a kid, uh, it's, it's very difficult. But in the packed train, if you try to squeeze like a kitten or a puppy, it's much easier. A small kid in this case is more like a helium ion. Helium ion is fairly small compared to most of the, uh, the atoms, but still the size is somewhat comparable. But for electrons, it's, well, it's much, much smaller than atoms, individual atoms. So the, the electrons can go in much deeper compared to, uh, to helium ions. Similarly for FIB, FIB has a small um, interaction volume because gallium is pretty large. Again, like in a packed train, you try to squeeze in another adult, it's very difficult. So the interaction volume is smaller in ion-based microscopy. Okay, and also there are other features I'll just quickly go through in helium ion micro microscopy. The second major advantage of using helium ion microscopy is it can, you can use non-conductive materials. 
you can directly image. non-conductive specimens. If you have ceramic nanoparticles, if you have like polymer nanofibers, if the fibers, if the particles, they are 10 nanometers in size, when you do coating, usually the coating, they are three to five nanometers. Then if you do coating, put it in SEM, what you're looking at is 30% to 50% of artifacts. Using helium ion microscopy, there's no need to coat the non-conductive materials. You can do imaging straight away. By the way, in Agifab, there's one helium ion microscope. Um, it's from Zeiss called Orion. If you're working on non-conductive uh, systems, this is one technique you may consider. Um, also, if we compare that, oh, by the way, like uh, no need to coat, no need for coating, no need for coating. Okay. Also, if we compare the helium ion mic uh, microscopy with focus ion beam, for helium ion microscopy, we use helium. In focus ion beam, we use gallium. Gallium is much heavier, much larger than helium. So the beam damage in helium ion microscopy is much smaller, so much less beam damage than FIB, which uses the gallium source. And another thing, in most of the cases, uh, you probably wouldn't worry too much, is due to the uh, the optics design, you have way better depths of field. What this tells you is even if you have super non-flat features, you can have everything in focus. If, if you recall what we learned in one of the early weeks about the, uh, the depth of field, uh, we discussed the effect of working distance. By playing with working distance, you can change the depth of field, but in helium ion microscopy, in, if you use a helium ion microscope, um, the depth of field is dramatically improved. It can be up to 1.5 millimeters, which is crazy. Helium ion microscopy is not um, um, like flawless or like it's, it's that there are some issues with helium ion microscopy. So what would be the, uh, like what would be one possible disadvantage of using helium ion microscopy on your sample? Any guesses? After looking at all the pros, what would be the cons, at least I know one con, one disadvantage. Any guesses? Okay, if we compare helium ion microscopy to SEM, we'll still, we'll still have more beam damage. because the energy of electrons is small. When you shine electrons on the specimen, um, you still introduce some damage. When you replace electrons by helium ions, helium ions are much, much heavier than electrons. The energy of each helium ion is much higher than that of each electron. Then you have more beam damage on the specimen. So when you do helium ion microscopy, you should avoid exposing one area for a long time. But if we compare the beam damage to FIB, it's not as bad as FIB. So it's somewhere between SEM and FIB. Any questions about helium ion microscopy before we move on?
Is it a lot more expensive than like gallium fib or just regular SEM? Yes, it's a lot more expensive. I don't know exactly how much that is. Uh, I don't know the hourly rate on Orion um, because the market is much smaller for the, uh, the helium ion microscope. One thing I, I learned is even the apertures, there's no motorized apertures. People have to align the apertures by hand. So you can tell like uh, not many people really using it. If an instrument is very user friendly, that means there's a big market. If the instrument is not user friendly, um, that, that means like the instrument is not as user friendly. The fact that um, there's a smaller market that uh, usually drives a product more expensive. Also helium, uh, I don't know whether helium is more expensive than gallium. I speculate helium is more expensive than, than gallium. Gallium is more readily available. I think also the source is more expensive. Helium ion microscopy is very useful if you work on non-conductive, super small materials. Okay, let's move to the third type of SEM related techniques. The third, tab, uh, the, the third type will go back to SEM, but in this case, we'll look at environmental SEM. So let's look at the, uh, the uh, um, regular SEM design. But now we should be able to draw the, uh, the schematic. We have the gun here. We have the specimen chamber. And the vacuum in the specimen chamber usually is around 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 5 tall. But for environmental SEM, what happens is you, you have very similar overall design. But here you have multiple apertures. This is exaggerating, by the way, not to scale. What I have drawn here those are something called PLAs. It's called pressure limiting apertures. So PLA. Inside the, uh, the column, inside the column, that's the source, again, the vacuum is really good. The vacuum can be 10 to the minus three, even up to 10 to the minus seven. But in the specimen chamber, in the specimen chamber, the vacuum is bad. That's why it's called environmental. It's, it simulates what we have in, in the natural environment. For example, it's 10 tall. The reason why you have multiple, we have multiple those, um, the reason why you have multiple pressure limiting apertures is to create this pressure difference. So in the gun chamber, in the column, the vacuum, the vacuum is very good, but inside the specimen chamber, the vacuum is bad. There will be some vacuum leakage through the pressure limiting apertures because the leakage, the, the, the leaking rate is slower than the pumping rate. So you can, you can maintain this difference. Let me ask you a fundamental question. Why in regular SEM, we want to have a good vacuum? Any guesses? Because you'll have less noise because your electrons will not like interact with air or anything. Exactly, exactly. The reason why you want high vacuum in SEM, so in this case, high vac, that's excellent. You want high vac in SEM, is to minimize electron scattering due to gas molecules, to minimize or to reduce.
in the case of environmental SEM, you actually try to take advantage of the electron scattering with gas molecules. And let's see how it works. By the way, like usually with the environmental SEM, there is a pipe inserted into the chamber and people can pump water vapor into that. Okay, let's look at how we can use the scattering events of electrons and the gas molecules in the chamber to do what we like to do. So we have the specimen here. We have the uh, We have electrons coming in. Assume it's a non-conductive material. Then what's gonna happen is it will charge. That's what we saw in one of the labs. The reason why it's charging is because when we throw in one electron, multiple electrons are coming out. There's a charge imbalance. So the sample will be positively charged, the sample surface. Or repeat it, when we throw in one high energy electron, multiple electrons will come out. That's why the sample is positively charged, not negatively charged. Okay, then we have secondary electrons getting ejected. So these are SEs. When there are gas molecules present in the chamber, what's gonna happen is, let me use a different color. We have the gas molecules floating around in the chamber. What's gonna happen is the secondary electrons getting ejected by the uh, primary electron from the source, they can also hit the gas molecules and ionize gas molecules. So it will turn the gas atom into gas ion plus electron. And the electrons now can be, if that happens very close to the specimen surface, then this electron can be attracted by the positively charged, the positively charges stored in the specimen and the balance the, uh, the, the charges, making the specimen neutral again. So let's write down the steps. In the first step, the electron beam, that's the first step, electron beam, E-beam, material interaction, will generate secondary electrons, generates secondary electrons. Then the secondary electrons can collide with the gas molecules. When the secondary electrons, they escape from the specimen surface. And the gas molecules are ionized. Giving us an ion plus another electron. In this case, it's also like a secondary electron. The regular secondary electron Electron now behaves more like a uh, um, primary elect uh, electron. Okay, and this electron, I'll just put dots around it. So that electron can travel to the charged surface. And this neutralizes the charge.
That's why for environmental SEM, you don't need to do coating as well. To me, this is one excellent example to turn something not desirable to your advantage. In regular SEM design, you don't want the gas molecules scattering the electrons. But in environmental SEM, you control the pressure so well, so precisely, that it reaches a balance. There's some scattering, and you, you make the scattering favorable instead of undesired. Because of that, in environmental SEM, the samples are usually very close to the uh, um, poppies, so you have a very small working distance. The reason why you have a small working distance is because you don't want the primary electrons interact too much with the gas molecules. There's one more note for the environmental SEM. You cannot use a regular uh, SCE detector. The environmental SEMs, you need a dedicated environmental secondary electron detector. Any questions about the uh, environmental SEM? With environmental SEM, you can do a lot of fancy in situ work to look at hydration and dehydration inside SEM. Towards the end of the class, I'll show you one video. Um, can the pressure gradient at PLA cause any issue? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, what kind of issues like you, are, you, you have in mind? I mean, um, we have different pressures and the point of environmental SEM is to basically adjust the pressure use the electron scattering. So I'm guessing there should be some gradient or some at, at the boundary of those apertures. That, that's, a very good, that's a very good point. Um, the uh, pressure in the specimen chamber, for example, if I use the pressure in the specimen chamber, like, like here, it's pretty much the same. The, the pressure in the column it's pretty much the same as well. The gradient largely um, um, exists across the, uh, the multiple pressure limiting apertures. You have so small hole, aperture is like a hole. The hole is so small. And uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the pressure difference is maintained because the hole is so small. It takes a long time to, to balance the other pressure. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to see if there's an ongoing gradient or... Okay, uh, in the chamber, not really. Inside the chamber, not really. Even if it's, uh, there's some gradient, it will be very, very local. Maybe it's just here. But as long as you're in the chamber, um, there's not much gradient. And as I said before, you want the specimen to be close like this is your specimen. In this case, when the electron travels, it's not really getting scattered by the poor vacuum in the material, uh, in, in the specimen chamber. In SEM, quite opposite, you can lower your specimen, whatever much you like to do. That was a good question. Any other questions before we try to summarize the entire course? This is the last technical chapter we have in this class. Okay, if no questions, we'll do a very quick recap of the entire class. So revision. In this class, we talked a lot about SEM as well as SEM related techniques. But if you think about it, we can divide that into three parts. The first part is instrumentation. So uh, let me try to draw a tree. So the first, um, we have SEM. This is, this is the, uh, the root.
and that branches out into three things. The first part is instrumentation. The second part is electron material interaction. And the third part, let me move this down here. The third part, these are SEM related techniques. In the instrumentation part, they're also, you can also branch out into two directions. The first part is kind of like the software part. I put quotation, quotation marks uh, because they are not really softwares. We also have the, uh, the hardware. From the software part, we discussed largely two things. That's resolution. And the contrast. These are the two things we discussed in details. We also talked about signal to noise ratio. We also talked about gamma, image processing, these kind of things. But resolution and the contrast, these are the two major things. For the hardware part, we discussed the electron sources. So, guns. We also discussed, we have condenser system. We also discussed there's objective system. The condenser converges the beam, condenses the beam. The objective system controls the focus. Also, we talked about the uh, working distance. Sorry, before working distance, that's scanning coil that controls the uh, magnification, scanning coils. And we have working distance. I will not write that down here. So everything you, you see here, the, they, they belong to uh, instrumentation. We also discussed electron beam material interaction. Now you have learned, I'm pretty sure you, you know this by heart now. There are three types or three major types of information you can generate from electron beam material interaction in the uh, SEM. The first type of signal is secondary electrons. The second type of signal is BSE. And the third type of signal, that's X-ray. We use these widely to study materials. From SE, you get topographic information. You get surface information. For BSE, you get qualitative Z contrast. You get qualitative chemical information. It's really Z contrast. Z is the atomic number. X-ray, you can identify what chemical species you have in the material. And also by looking at BSE, the ones diffracted, we can also do Aki and EBSD, if we are looking at the diffraction. So that's the second part of S, uh, the SEM class. The third part, that's SEM related techniques. We mainly talked about some of them in details, others are not in much details, four of those. So the first type is FIB, focus ion beam. The second type is xenon FIB or plasma FIB. The third type, helium ion microscopy, we covered today, as well as environmental SEM. So this is pretty much the entire class in a nutshell. 
at least personally, I found this is a very nice way for me to learn a subject. You may apply this technique to any classes you learn. You can start from one thing that's, that ties everything together, then break that up into big chunks, then go smaller and smaller. So this is more like a knowledge tree you have after taking the class. Any questions about the revision? The revision, revision is very quick. The, the one I did just now, it's, it's very quick and very brief. The idea is to give you a big picture of what's going on in this class. And anything we learned can, can fall into one of the three categories, instrumentation, electron material interaction, and SEM related techniques. Any questions? The video uh, is from FBI. I will not play the entire video, but just want to draw attention to some of the uh, examples they show. Okay, this is a good example. So it shows hydration of some material. You can see it's swelling, it's swelling. Look at the pressure here. Now, the pressure goes down. There's dehydration. I'll play this part again. Let's wait a few seconds. Okay. So this is in the dry state. Now you can pump in the water vapor and you can see it's swelling. And now you remove water, va uh, water vapor and there's dehydration going on. Okay, that's another good example. Just have a look on the left. Again, it's swelling due to water absorption. You can make really fancy movies if they are using environmental SEM. In this class, we discussed plasma fit, helium ion microscopy, and environmental SEM. Um, for environmental SEM, you've seen some video clips. Um, let's look at the, uh, the plasma fit and HIM in the slides. But plasma fit, again, like plasma is the fourth state of matter. And um, the, the cheapest way to create plasma, you can buy from the, the toy shops, toy stores. I'm pretty sure you've seen or you had one of these. So you, what you see here, those are actually created by plasma. You can also attack people with plasma. So uh, if you are powerful enough, um, like in Star Wars, you can use plasma to, to attack. Okay, so for the helium, uh, helium ion microscope, that's what I described. So these are the three atoms at the very tip of the tungsten tip or the very apex of the tungsten tip. So it's really atomically sharp. So what happens is one of the, uh, the, the, the tungsten atoms will really light up and give off a lot of heliums during the, uh, the, the process, during the illumination process. And this is the Orion helium ion micro, uh, microscope. Some comparisons on the left, that's SEM image. On the right, that's helium ion microscopy image. You can see some differences. This is a better example. On the left, you, sh you see um, the top of those spheres that are in focus, but the, the, the substrate, you still see some very fine particles that are out of focus, they are blurry. But in helium ion microscopy, from the substrate to the top of those microspheres, everything are in focus. So helium ion microscopy gives you much improved field of view, field of, uh, field of depth. So field of depth, not field of view, field of depth. So you have a large distance, everything is in focus. Also, that illuminates the, uh, 
advantage of using helium ion micro, uh, microscopy. Uh, on the left, there's an SEM image. I cannot remember the, uh, the, the material. I took the uh, images from uh, internet. Uh, on the left, you have to coat your fibers and the morphology is kind of like destroyed. You can still tell those are fibers, but they don't represent the true morphology. On the right, that's the helium ion uh, my, uh, micrograph, and you can see the pristine form or original form of those fibers. Okay, very last slide for the last lecture. We discussed um, SEM for the entire semester. Uh, I don't know how many of you actually wondered who invented SEM. The person who invented SEM, his name is von Arden. Von Arden was born in 1907 in Germany. Um, he got his first patent on electronic tube for applications in wireless telegraphy when he was 15. So he, he was a genius. He was a genius. Then in 1927, he quitted university and started educating himself because he thought uh, professors um, are stupid, I guess, and they are not able to catch up with him. So he decided to quit university. And, and in 1928, he, he inherited a large amount of money from his uncle and established his own lab and a company. So if we look at our age, people talk about Steve Jobs, how he quitted university, then started Apple. But similar things happened a long time ago, like even 100 years ago. Um, smart people, they, they quit at university and do something great. I'm not saying you should quit university. I'm just saying those are some outliers. Uh, it does not happen only recently. It happens even 100 years before us. And in 1931, uh, he had the first world pub, uh, public demonstration of TV using a cathode ray tube. For many students, you guys are too young to see the cathode ray TV like in the box. Now you see flat screen. But when I was a kid, TV, TV sets, those are boxes. At the back of the screen, there's a cathode ray. Then there's, there are scanning coils installed at the back, scans the electron beam on the screen to show images. Using the same principle, using the scanning coils. So Van Arden he invented SEM in 1937. And SEM was invented three years after the first TEM. Then in 1945, Germany lost the, uh, the Second World War and he was taken to the Soviet Union along with other scientists. In 1953, he moved back to Eastern Germany. In 1997, he passed away. The Nobel Prize awarded to TEM, not SEM, happened in 1998. I don't know if he lived until like 1998, whether he will receive Nobel Prize or not. But definitely look at how many labs, how many universities, how many companies using SEM, the impact is profound. So that's all for the lecture part of the SEM class.